the ad music was so relaxing. So it's a good thing to move into uh, talking about something that I think most of the states are going through right now, or at least contemplating in the near future, which is a, a rewrite or an upgrade of our original voter registration databases. So first, I just want to thank Amy and Matt said for inviting me to participate in today's panel, although I've only recently been appointed executive director for the Illinois State Board of Elections. I've worked for the agency for about 13 years, so I feel like I've kind of aged along with our original voter registration database. And so I can say that uh, it's, in, it's in need of an upgrade uh, to meet the current demands. So Illinois, like many of you, is about to undergo a rewrite and upgrade project. So I appreciate the opportunity today to speak directly with three states that have completed or are engaging in their own rewrite process. So to begin, um, you're each in different places in your voter registration database upgrade. Can each of you provide a brief overview of where you are right now and the amount of time that it took you to get there? So if uh, Karen would like to start. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so we are replacing um, our original system, which went into place in 1995. Um, it was originally built for resident and voter management um, and all of the election stuff has been built on top of it. So we're, we've been talking about replacing it for many years. Um, in 2019, we did an RFI um, just to see what was out there in the market and to see um, maybe what criteria we should be looking to include in our requirements that we hadn't already considered. Um, that gave us a really good idea of what was important to us. Um, after that, we released an RFP in January of 2021. Um, so that was kind of when our project officially started. Um, we reviewed score resp scored responses and made a final decision in April of last year. Um, we finalized the contract in June. And we spent the fall um, basically doing um, our current system review uh, and database model structure with that vendor, kind of doing a review of everything to let them know what we were dealing with to start with um, and how our data looked and some of the things that we were trying to solve. And since then, we've been working on new system requirements and building out use cases. Um, we have a target completion date of December 2022. So um, essentially from finalizing the contract in June 2021, we're hoping to finish um, in December 2022. So roughly a year and a half of actual effort into it. Hey, thank you. So moving to Stuart, you're a little further along in the process. So if you'd like to let us know about an overview of your process and exactly how long it took you to complete the update. Yeah, so we had a real aggressive timeline, but nothing like Georgia, nothing at all like Georgia. So we, uh, we started our uh, project back in, in 2014 as sort of a discussion on modernizing the election system. But then when we actually got contracts in place, uh, we, we were ripping along. We had uh, about 12 months to get it in. We got it in on in June of 2019. And so now we're, we're coming up on its 3 year anniversary, I guess, of being uh, live and. Uh, in use. Uh, so right now we're in maintenance and operation and, and continuing to improve. And um, as Amy kind of noticed and noted earlier that uh, we added Blake to this panel last week after he noticed up for everyone that they did a rewrite in, I believe it was five months, if we've all heard correctly. So just a quick overview of your process. I've, most of us can't even get through procurement. Well, at least in Illinois, we can't get through procurement in five months. So to hear somebody could complete the project in that amount of time kind of blows a lot of our minds. If, if you want to give a quick overview of what you guys did. Yeah, definitely. And I've definitely got some uh, some bigger bags under my eyes and some more gray hair for sure. But we're, we're a couple of weeks away or a few weeks away from from launching the registration system. And it really started the, the project started at, uh, with our secretary of state uh, deciding they wanted to do or he wanted to do a modernization initiative across all divisions that are under uh, the secretary of state's umbrella. So it wasn't just the elections division, but we were obviously uh, obviously part of that. And um, it started about the middle of, of last year when 
our office as a whole decided um, to start looking into those options. And, and we were thinking initially that uh, the voter registration system that we would start working on it and it would probably be something that we would implement uh, after, after the 2022 cycle uh, that we would really start, start trying to implement. Um, as part of the criteria, we, we looked first at, uh, at IT services vendors that already had contracts with the state to help expedite a little bit that, uh, that procurement process. Um, obviously, security was a was a was a big um, factor in in the procurement side of things, um, and then in <clears throat> I would say um, middle to late November, um, we started kind of looking at the timeline, and and after after the selection of our vendor, uh, which is um, the the IT services provider is called Kerasoft, and then the the software platform that we're using is Salesforce. Um, and then the integrator of the, of the software uh, and, and the builder of our voter registration system is a company called MTX. Um, once we started kind of looking at what was possible with that and also considering um, our, our current state, um, we decided that in, in November uh, that it was achievable for us to um, establish a essentially a, a three to four month uh, timeline and to execute it and um, and and now we're sitting here um, looking pretty solid on a on a launch date about about three weeks from now um, so I'm, I'm excited about it uh, it's it's been a lot of work I'm not gonna lie about that um, it's been a lot of late nights um, but um, but yeah so that's that's a, a high level overview of our process to to get where we are yeah, so definitely speaking about work and, and how how these projects usually are layered on top of the work of our usual staff and resources can sometimes be low. So we have to do more with the current staff that we have. Uh, let's talk about the staffing for each of these projects. Did you have a staffer or a team of staffers dedicated to managing the project? dedicated to overseeing the vendor? Uh, did this team of staff re remain the same throughout the project or did it switch maybe from elections minded to technical staff? So uh, we'll go right back around. I'll, I'll go back to you, Blake, so that you can discuss how, how you guys got through this in the last few months. Yeah, so as part of working with our modernization initiative, we, we already had a team, um, essentially a, a team of uh, of consultants that were working and kind of providing us guidance as far as our organizational structure. And they were also going to help kind of guide us through uh, the process of working with a vendor through our modernization initiative uh, for the office. And so what they did was essentially set up a, a governance structure <clears throat> for our project. And as part of that, uh, for, our, um, for our implementation of our voter registration system, we had out of our office, a product manager manager and then out of our uh, IT division's office, a product owner. And essentially their roles were um, to, to be essentially 80 to 90% of their time consumed uh, with this project. Uh, we had hired someone uh, back in, he started in September, uh, 22 years old. Um, and he is um, the best hire that I've, that I've made. Uh, he had, comes with a business management background um, he's tech savvy, um, and he can, he's got a, a ton of energy. Um, and I feel like I tell people, I feel kind of like, uh, Phil Jackson in the nineties, you know, I just try to stay out of his way. And he, he's kind of on Michael Jordan a little bit because he is, he's put in so many hours on this project and he was our systems manager, uh, his position that we had with our, with our current voter registration system. And we transitioned him over into that product manager role. And starting in September, or not September, and starting in December is when we started uh, with the discovery process. And we, from about 12 o'clock every day to about five to six o'clock in the evening, um, he would be on calls. And oftentimes I would be on as much as I could and other members of our team on discovery calls, uh, showing, the, uh, showing the vendor you know, aspects of our voter registration system and discovery lasted about four weeks. And it was every day uh, from about 12 o'clock every day to five o'clock, six o'clock every day uh, that discovery happened. And uh, and that was the, the so as far as staffing, we had our governance structure 
um, with our with our leadership. Every week we would have reporting up the chain of command from the product manager and the product owner um, in, in case there were any red flags that came up. Um, you know, we could we could address those in a hurry. Uh, but as, as far as, you know, staffing, uh, we did create the product manager and the product owner roles uh, for the project. And then also, you know, aside from that, we didn't add any other positions, but we did uh, create a, a structure um, through which any issues could be reported or, or, um, or identified uh, relatively quickly. Thank you. And Stuart, did you use similarly in-house staff? Did you make any additional hires to manage the project? What was your process through it? Yeah, we had a we had a team kind of started from 2014 that was brought on, um, kind of had experience, people that you know, kind of knew recruitments of those times. Uh, one piece of advice I would say is, you know, find somebody in your office that's going to, you know, you kind of have that vision, like Blake was talking about, where you've got somebody that's like, hey, I'm going to be here for a while because there's there's so many times where people get in and do the project management and like complete something and then they they leave because they're retired or you know they've they've got the experience in the game and then we you lose all of that knowledge that of why you did something certain ways and and why the system's built certain ways so um, I'm I'm glad to to say that the people that we we brought on were sort of kind of in the mid tiers and now they're kind of escalating up into higher ranks into the the organization now after that having that experience but now they can teach everybody else hey do it this way now. Because that's one of the things that I learned early on in my career is that there's a lot of people that will tell you that you've got a lot of boxes to move, but there's very few people that will actually help you move the boxes. And so that was what we we strive to do is we had that team that we had enough flexibility in the governance uh, that we brought in to start to put these teams together to be able to figure out what's working and just sort of support that. And then get rid of what's not working and, and have that sort of flexibility and idea built in. Uh, so that that's that's the kind of the key to success is being really, really agile and, and moving very quickly on things that are not working very well. Um, and so we had a we had a, a governance structure. We also had all kinds of red tape from you know the uh, state uh, IT. Uh, Infrastructure that's called Watech here, but essentially they have they require you to bring in all of these project resources that uh, you know sometimes help, sometimes are a nuisance. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we we were able to do better and come up with a better product at the end, where um, we had to bring on uh, a project manager for a little uh, for for the whole term, an assistant project manager for a while, a project assistant. Um, but then we also had um, uh, some required elements that we had to come in and make sure that we were meeting uh, OCIO standards and things like that. So we had a, a small but mighty uh, management team, um, and then we started to build up our uh, operational support team for, to be first level support when it was deployed, which is quite difficult because you're having to maintain your current system while you transition to another one. So you're really having to uh, bring on this new staff uh, while they're also supporting the old system. So one thing that we would have done differently is provide more uh, support training on how to to use the system to our internal staff so that they could train uh, the external staff on how to use the system. But you know, it, on a, such a short timeline, you're just sort of like humming along and and hoping people are catching the ten percent that they 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 can hear and take away from your meetings. Thanks. And so, Karen, who have who have been your box movers throughout the project? Uh, similar uh, in-house people, people who have moved up, continuing on with the agency. So we currently manage our um, system that we have. We manage that in-house already. So we already have um, numerous staff here that we needed for the project. Um, we did hire one dedicated project manager who is only focused on that. Um, and then as far as all the other support stuff on the IT side, we have database administrators here that are familiar with the current system and that will help with that migration. Um, same with our network operations and infrastructure team, cybersecurity, they're already working with the vendor. 
um, as well as a dedicated business analyst, and then our um, subject matter experts from elections, um, from our elections division. So we already had kind of teams in place, application developers, all the necessary folks that will eventually support the new system. We've minimized changes to the current system. We're trying to, to minimize what we're doing there where we know we're moving away from it. it. It doesn't make sense now to put a lot of enhancements in or make a lot of changes. So we're really trying to keep that pretty, um, pretty static at this point. So we've been able to transition most people over just to focusing on the new system and helping with those requirements and getting that system ready to go. Great, thanks. So moving away from the, the internal staffing, obviously to engage in a project like this, we do have to select a vendor. And as noted in the previous section, in election administration, a lot of times vendor reliance can become a problem. We, you know, we don't want the vendor guiding, guiding our needs. We want them to work for us. And then also because the procurement project process can be so long and belabored that when you get to the end, you do want to have selected the appropriate uh, right choice for a vendor. So as you considered the different options, what was the most important criteria for each of you that determined your vendor selection? Um, I, I'll go back to Karen and start with you. Um, our most important our most important criteria, which unfortunately eliminated a lot of vendors for us, was that at the end of the project, we wanted to own the source code. So that um, really narrowed down the, the number of folks that could uh, appropriately respond to our RFP. Um, but that was a key component for us that really was important. Um, and how that kind of ties in is, you know, we wanted to work with a partner that would help us with um, kind of managing flexibility in the long term uh, maintenance of the system. So whether or not they help us in the short term and hand it off to us you know, on that cutover day, or we continue to work with them for a short time after while we transition, we wanted to be able to build a good relationship where we could extend it, but we weren't reliant on a vendor specific solution so that if we did decide to make a change later or the partnership needed to be modified, we still owned our own system, we owned our code, and we weren't necessarily needing to replace the system again if the vendor relationship wasn't successful. That makes sense. I think that with the original database build outs, a lot of us found ourselves kind of reliant on vendors that way. So Stuart, was that a similar criteria that guided your selection as you made the choice on who exactly to work with for this project? Yeah, we, we had to actually go back out and do the bid a second time because our criteria was so limited, I guess, that we only got one vendor that actually submitted. And so we went back out to actually get some competition back in the game. but. Uh, so our, our most, I would say that what we considered most heavily was being able to have the best of every element of the system. Uh, a lot of vendors come in with this full package deal and some things you like, some things you don't like. And so what we wanted to be able to do was say, we want the best voter registration system. We want the best online ballot. We want the best petition processing. And if it doesn't work, we're going to rip that thing out and replace it with something else. And, uh, be able to have that opportunity going forward. We needed the system immediately and, and be able to have all the parts uh, to get us over the hump. But then, like uh, like uh, mentioned, right, you, you kind of reevaluate after it's in, in, in real life and being used in the real world and say, yeah, it's not working for us. We're going to do something else. And I'll go to Blake now, because as I said, I think the procurement aspect was very surprising to a lot of us. If you could, you know, select a vendor and, and move towards the total rebuild in 5 months. So what were some of the criteria that you considered as you move forward the project? You are muted. I do see you're having some connectivity issues with your video, but uh, I don't know if that's affecting your audio as well. We'll let Blake work out his tech issues and we'll come back to that. <laughs> No, that sounds good. I think I think the next question is an important one because, uh, you know, as you get, oh, 
I do see Blake back. I don't know if you wanted to answer that first. Hey, uh, sorry about that. Um, I joined via phone and now I can hear myself through the phone. I'm actually, uh, because we're moving so fast, we're in the middle of, of training. And so I'm down in, uh, in one of our county office locations and, uh, and using the, the guest Wi-Fi. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to join our, join our training again. Um, but I think the, the, the question was about procurement processes and that sort of thing. And, and because, as I mentioned, um, the, the technology that we're using is part of a broader initiative that our Secretary of State's office is doing. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I did not personally have a lot um, with the procurement process, but the, the, throughout the process, the, um, the highest criteria was, was basically um, was, was security. And then also uh, the, um, the contract was already uh, was with a company that was already a considered a state vendor and it was already a selected contract for technology services. And then from there, we were able to choose a sub or there was a subcontractor, which is Salesforce, um, who, who we're working with, and it's going to be the tech technology platform for our voter registration system. Thanks. So moving past the, the initial stages of, you know, staffing on site and then the vendor selection, once, once you moved into more of the development and testing as major stakeholders and important users of the system, uh, the local election officials, you know, they have a certain level of involvement and uh, demand to know exactly what's going on with these pro projects. So. How in each way did you open up the process to your election authorities, either in the development side or testing it once it had, you know, been developed at the earliest stage? Uh, Stuart, if you want to go first and just give us an idea of what you guys did. Yeah, this was, I mean, obviously a critical part of any project is the communication and that that was always the struggle is finding the best way to communicate, especially with you know, local election administrators that are just inundated with security briefings and trying to get ramped up for election. They're understaffed, overworked. And, and then I'm trying to like, hey, you know, what if you had a dream system, what could it do? What would it look like? And so, yeah, the the local election officials, keeping them involved and engaged was is a, a, a daunting task, but it was it was a very important one. We visited all 39 counties and met with them individually uh, in person uh, when back when that was a thing and uh, we would go through all of the requirements with them and make sure that we are meeting their needs and answering their questions. Now, in, in, a, in a project like ours, where we're doing that, and then you go out to bid and go out to get all your requirements. That's plenty of time for the legislature to change laws. It's plenty of time for people to forget what they told you a month ago. And so the, the requirements are, uh, we're constantly shifting and changing related to the system, but those communications with stakeholders, we were adapting just like in the project management. We were inviting them into calls. We were providing them with you know, information via email. So just sort of keeping communication flowing was, was something that we, we had to do in order to be successful because of the short timeline. We weren't able to do things perfectly the way we'd want to because we didn't have 10 years to, to release the system. We had one. And Karen, did you similarly collaborate with the election officials, you know, right from the get go, or is it something that they came in a little bit later for you? Um, so here in Massachusetts, we're city town based or municipality based. So we don't um, work at the county level. So we had already had a user group in place um, of roughly maybe 15 um, communities that participated in monthly meetings for the current system. So when we decided to go ahead and replace the system that we have, we decided to expand that group to represent 10% of the 351 municipalities. Um, and that gave us kind of our steering committee that's helping guide us on some of the decision making related to requirements. Um, functionality, some of the preferences they might have. Um, they obviously use the system differently than we do. So um, for especially a lot of the repetitive tasks, what's the fastest, simplest way to do it? Um, we've been communicating with them. We have um, weekly emails, we have monthly meetings, and we send out a lot of surveys. So 
different questions based on the module or the function that we're focusing on with the vendor um, as far as use cases and things like that. So we can try to get their feedback in before we sign off on that section. Um, and then the, the plan would also be to try to incorporate any of the nice to haves that they've wanted for a long time that we haven't been able to incorporate so far. Um, not necessarily requirements, but um, a lot of just those nice to haves that maybe could make their lives easier that we hadn't considered in the past. And then last, they will be participating in, in the user acceptance testing. So as we release each module kind of for testing, they'll be helping us with that. And then the whole integration testing at the end of the, at the end of the development cycle. So um, yeah, we've been working with them. And again, we already kind of had something in place, but we did expand it and try to get a little bit better communication flowing um, to make sure that we weren't missing anything as we as we built the system from the start instead of having them come in at the end and tell us they want everything different. <laughs> and Blake, as you're rolling out your new system, you know, how did the stakeholders test or how are they involved uh, throughout the process up to including where you're at right now? Yeah, so I think I mentioned earlier that even in like November, early November of last year, um, so we were starting to get the ball rolling on this. We were thinking, okay, there's there's no way that we could get this done uh, in time for 2022. Uh, and that was kind of early on in the vendor relationship. We were still getting to know them and that kind of thing and see what they were capable of. And um, I would say when we started realizing that it would be a possibility, uh, towards the end of November, you know, we thought, okay, if we're going to do this, there's, there's no way we can do it without having county buy. And I've been at the county level before in a couple of different states and, uh, my, our deputy director has been there and other people in our office have been there and, uh, and, and our counties are tired and we know that they're change fatigued and, um, and, you know, in, in 2020, we rolled out a new voter or new, new voting system. Uh, and they're tired from that. Uh, we did our first risk limiting audit in November 2020 that turned into a, to a full hand tally. Um, so they're tired. And uh, so we knew there wasn't going to be any way that we could do this without them if we were looking at implementing it on sh such a short timeline. So what we did uh, is when we, when we realized, okay, this is a possibility, um, we, we have 159 counties. So we called about 15 of them um, and that are, that are, uh, that are kind of champion counties, uh, the, the directors who's, um, I would say probably 10 or so who, whose directors carry a lot of voice in their region. Um, and, and then a few others that, that, uh, you know, we chose a couple that, uh, that generally, you know, tend to not be our biggest fans and we wanted them in the room too, and to get their voice. And so we brought them in, uh, we had a meeting at our, at our Capitol, which is across the street from our actual offices. And, uh, we provided them food and we, uh, we laid everything out for them. And, and essentially our, our voter registration system that we have currently, so not our new system, uh, is a good system and it's secure, um, but it's been around a while and it's a little, little older. And so when they see things they want improved or changed, we can't always make that because it's, it's uh, make those changes. It's hard coded stuff. It's, we gotta get with the vendor and it takes days and weeks sometimes if we're able to make the change. And so we're not able to be, you know, agile with responding to county needs. And we said, look, if we want to be able to respond to your needs. We want to be able to support you throughout 2022 and beyond. We think we have a solution to be able to do it. And we laid it all out and we got their feedback. And um, I was really, really nervous going into that meeting. And um, everybody who, everybody left and they were like, yeah, you guys got to do this. And which made me feel better. And it's like, all right, we, we can do it. And then from that point, it was 15 counties. We took 10 of them. We put them on a training subcommittee. We took 15 of them, or we took the other five and put them on a, a testing subcommittee. And then every other, every other week, we were meeting with the group as a whole to provide them updates, to get their feedback on development. So we we're showing them things very, very early on uh, from the earliest of demos to get their, to get their feedback on it so that we, we could provide feedback to the development team if we needed to. Um, and then also on kind of a, a rotating basis, we were meeting with either the, the testing subcommittee of counties or the training subcommittee of counties uh, so that every week we were, we were seeing people either face to face or on Zoom. Uh, so we had their input on from the, from the, from the get go. 
um, at the, the earliest that we had something to train on, uh, which would have been um, early February, um, which two and a half months into the process, we, um, we, we started getting training out. We did, we did webinars um, and uh, I would say uh, late February, we had a mid to late February, we had a, a, a testing environment that they could get, get credentials and go into and, and start seeing things. And we, we, uh, we set expectations as, okay, this is building a house. Okay. So if you go in, in mid, uh, uh, you know, in early to mid February, you might still see the studs. All right. The sheetrock might not be up yet completely. There might not be all the shingles on the roof. So if you want to see everything pretty, wait a month and then go in and see it. But if you want to see things early on, like go in there, you can provide us feedback. Just don't let it scare you if every little button doesn't work and that kind of thing. So that's kind of the, um, the, the stage that we set and the framework that we gave them um, with that. And we, you know, again, we wouldn't be doing this if those 15 counties had left that roof differently uh, in December. Uh, but they, they got on board early. Um, again, we, we chose people that could be champions for the new voter registration system. And so uh, as far as communicating with counties and working with them, um, we did that from the very beginning, and it's going to be a huge reason why this project will be successful. Well, I'm glad that you touched on, you know, that need for agility within a system um, from election officials and also recognizing that at the state level. For most of us, we, we really never know what our legislature is going to mandate, what needs to be built in, you know, almost overnight sometimes. Uh, Illinois had to enact automatic voter registration fairly quickly, um, you know, unfunded mandate, and had to learn how to connect our system to other state agency systems to conduct that. So for Stuart and Blake being that you've both completed the project at this stage. Um, how did you approach building flexibility into your systems? Uh, what features did you include? What features are you the most proud of? Any information that you could give to the group related to that, I'm sure would benefit most of us as we do this project. Yeah, I, I can go first real quick. And it, you know, we are still, uh, as we sit here today, we're about uh, just under three weeks from kind of our go live. So we're just Kind of finishing everything up, um, you know. The I, I don't have an IT background, so I'll be honest there. But with I've been very impressed with the the two vendors that we have, uh, and kind of the analogy that's been given to me is uh, is Salesforce, kind of like Legos, as in not everything, or you kind of have uh, a lot of out of the box piece, out of the box uh, components that can be built into a system, and so. Salesforce or the Legos and the MTX are integrator. They're like the people that build the houses. And so we're telling them where to put things, where to hang pictures, where to put the sheetrock, where to put the walls um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and one of the things that I mentioned with our, with our current voter registration system, a lot of the features are, um, are hard coded features. And so it takes um, significant code changes in order to change, um, change little things. Like for, for example, um, in 2020, uh, we wanted to put into our absentee module for tracking absentee ballots, um, the ability for when a ballot comes back to the, the office, if it's missing a signature or something like that, and, and we need to provide the opportunity to a voter to cure that, we wanted to add a little checkbox um, that, you know, the county could select and say, this is going through the cure process so that we could track that information and we can get insight into that. Um, to add that checkbox was a significant hard code change. Um, with this new technology and the new system that we're, we're doing, we're talking about a 10 or 15 minute change for something like that. And so that was a very important piece of that. We want to be able to respond to county needs in a, in a, a decent amount of time. It doesn't have to be hours. You know, it could be 24 hours, 48 hours for, for stuff like that. But we wanted to improve our response time. And so, um, you know, this, the current system that we have was rolled out in 2012. Lots changed in the world of technology in, in 10 years. Um, so uh, as far as agility, that was that was a big reason why we decided to go ahead and make the make the change so we can better respond to county needs. Oh man, Blake, I I don't know how you're gonna do a lot can change in three weeks. So I I pray for you. 
Uh, so we actually had some bookends because the legislature decided to fund our project, but also pass a bunch of legislation and require it to be in, <laughs> uh, in place at a certain date and time. And so we were like, okay, well, I guess you set the, the end of our project as well. So we were really hustling to get things through. And I think you look at those critical functions as your first, your kind of MVP, and you'll hear that as you start to take your, um, you know, you get your projects underway. You'll look for that minimum viable product and and say, what what do we absolutely have to do have in front of us in order to successfully complete an election? It may not look pretty, right? It may not look very pretty on the screen. Everybody might go, I wish the color was a, a different shade of blue. It makes me upset. And you're like, well, you know, as long as it's stable and consistent and reliable, that's the most uh, pressing concern. But one of the things that uh, we, we, I wish I would have known, uh, and, and we'll have another question here about lessons learned, but one of the things that we did, and I wish I would have known better, is actually, as I mentioned earlier, about having a system in which you can sort of have modules kind of break on and uh, off of the system. And there's so many tools out there that exist today. You don't need to recreate them. So Microsoft Word, the integration, if I, would almost guarantee your your system's going to be built off of SQL. And if it is, it's got an integration to Microsoft built in, right? Like, it's just like, you don't even have to develop that thing. It is there. You have to have the security in place to make sure that it's, you know, you know least privileged and all of that. So you you when you're starting to look at your system, really kind of break away from the election process and really look at the user-centric experience, right? If they're doing their data entry in Microsoft Word, build a system that can integrate with a tool they're comfortable with. They don't have to learn anything new, it, and they can just sort of do the mail merge like they, they commonly do with a different keystroke, whatever it is, but they, they would be very comfortable with that. Uh, then build out those functionalities that are extremely time intensive, but don't happen very often. So, for example, an integration with your GIS uh, software, ArcGIS is like, it's got, if you build a geo database, it, it's got the same integration with SQL. So it, those things don't happen very often, but when they do, it is extremely time intensive. And, and we obviously we are all going through redistricting now, but in the state of Washington, we could go through a redistricting in one of our counties or cities at a moment's notice now that they could challenge the the, the lines that are in any of our cities and counties and take them to court and have them redraw all their lines and then the county would have to redistrict on that. So uh, being able to sort of build in these integrations rather than recreate something from scratch where you're like trying to imagine, okay, what would the system have to do here? Well, no, just go find your favorite of whatever that is and then show that to your vendor. This is what we want. We want our data to go in here. And and just and just be as clear as that instead of having to rebuild all of these things. Um, the other challenge that you're gonna you're gonna end up having with like your systems and, and flexibility and being adaptable is on the reports. A lot of people put data into your system. You got all kinds of entry points. We got 39 counties, not 150 like Blake. That's that's again, I'm 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 praying for you, Blake. But uh, the they're putting all of this data in. They need to be able to get it back out. They need to be able to get it for their reports or public records requests or whatever they need to do. And so that that piece is also very critical um, because there's there's tools that they're using like Excel or what we've started to uh, kind of involve more in our operation is like business intelligent applications. Microsoft has one, but there's others out there that you would be able to kind of get these predefined exports out of the system and be able to integrate that into uh, a public facing report. So you are reducing phone calls or reducing maybe uh, somebody's job that has to be like 30 steps into an export that goes to a, a public site and then it's made available. Um, and a great example would be anyone that uses the voting information project where there's a defined uh, extract file where you just sort of set up a nightly operation that just kicks this file out and you would never have to even worry about it. It would be just routinely done. And so then when you're doing these sort of integrations and making your system flexible, 
You also have to get involved with like the user feedback, making sure that the users are getting alerted when things get done and completed. Uh, so when your system's um, kind of becoming more uh, user efficient and, and reliable and flexible to their needs, you also need to factor in that element of it is that you, you may be taking out steps of their process where they were using as these check-ins that that got done because I saw it get done. Well, if they don't have to do it anymore, you need to sort of build in these sort of user feedback elements into your, your system. The other thing about building a flexible system is the audit trail. So being able to not only um, see all of the activity as you guys are familiar with, but whenever you're building a function of the system, it needs to be something that is auditable, something, so the users will ask for a lot. The users will ask for a lot, but they sure don't like it when you can prove to them that they're using it incorrectly. So there's these features that the users will ask for, but they really don't like it when it's being audited and tracked. And if you're gonna do that, we're gonna track it and we're gonna make sure you're using it right. Um, so that's that's one of the things that you need to really factor in as well as um, when you're when you're getting all of this feedback into your system and trying to prioritize the needs of your users. You also need to think about what they're not asking for, because that's 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 where the the rubber is going to meet the road. Uh, that's where you're going to end up either meeting your deadlines or not, because they'll they'll end up leaving out these little areas that are really really important if that feature starts breaking things down the line. Thanks, I think, I think those are all great recommendations. They're obviously helpful to consider when we're embarking on the project, but also we know when we do something like this, that's a major technical endeavor, that along with what you can recommend people do, there's sometimes lessons learned about what they will you know, what maybe they shouldn't do or what you would have done differently. So Karen, with the project and where you're at right now, uh, is there any advice uh, as to what you would have done differently or anything that you would suggest somebody maybe necessarily not do with the project um, to help us out as we move into it? Um, I think probably one of the most important things and not necessarily that we learned it from this project, but that we've just learned over time here is that um, having solid business requirements is probably the most important thing to have those documented and documented very, very well. Um, I think that we've had challenges with that in the past. Um, another, another key component is probably understanding the time commitment for staff. Um, I think Michelle Tassinari and I uh, underestimated maybe how much time we would be committing um, each day, each week uh, to the project. And I'm sure Blake, um, from his description, uh, probably was was challenged there too. But um, definitely planning the project out, recognizing how much time you need to commit to it, and whether or not that's realistic, I think is a really big piece of it. Um, you know, acting as a subject matter expert along with CIO duties, it, it's been a bit challenging probably to to stay on track with my own tasks that are due. Um, so I think that probably that was one piece of it that maybe I underestimated how much how much time I was going to need. And so trying to make sure that I'm not the one um, delaying the project schedule uh, is is a regular occurrence that it's usually me. So, <laughs> so um, that's something that I would definitely um, recommend people think about. And again, we tried to work around election cycles, but we didn't plan when we released the RFP and we were working on the contract for re-precincting and redistricting to be delayed. So having those things also happen on a schedule that we weren't prepared for, um, definitely plan for the unexpected. Um, and then last, I think talking to national colleagues for references, recommendations, lessons learned, um, Rob in Rhode Island was extremely helpful to us. Um, and so I think having those relationships and being able to ask and get opinions from peers in, in other states and some of the things they're doing just like we're doing today, um, I think that that's extremely valuable. How about you, Blake? Any uh, lessons learned that you want to contribute uh, other than the, the staffing and the, the, the timing requirements? Yeah, um, 
you know, I, I guess I'll have, maybe have a few more lessons learned in, in about three or four weeks. Um, but uh, try to pick a longer timeline. That's one. Um, I would say, um, you know, definitely we already talked about getting getting counties involved. You know, one of the first things that we did um, right after we decided, okay, we're doing this, um, is we got all of our elections division uh, together, and along with the product owner from IT and uh, and the the CIO over over our IT department, and we had a kickoff event. Let everybody know, hey, look, next three months, this is. You know, we got all this other stuff going on, but this is going to be a, a priority. All right, we're going to execute this. Um, we have this product manager who's um, who's an all star. Uh, thankfully, it was like I said, it was an all star hire, somebody that's willing to put in the hours at seven, eight, eleven o'clock at night. Um, he was willing to do it, and so he put the time in. Um, but we we had that meeting, that that kickoff meeting uh, with our team and a couple folks from IT. And you know, I, I wish I had, um, I wish we had done a little bit better job at that point in time of, um, of bringing in our entire um, IT department because there were lots of times during the project or so far um, that, you know, we there's been something for for data migration or or, or whatever the particular task was. And we needed to utilize somebody who wasn't necessarily a higher level, um, you know, IT person or, or wasn't even, um, you know, somebody who who is frequently working on the project, but it was a particular um, assignment that they normally do. Uh, and and they were not as familiar or well versed with the urgency of the project um, as, as we would have liked. And so I wish in that initial kind of internal kickoff meeting that we did that we had made it larger that we'd brought in um, more stakeholders than we did. Um, but uh, but so that was that was something looking back. I, I wish I'd done a little bit differently. Um, you know, one of the things that we I can't emphasize enough, kind of the, the people, the people side of this, because along with all the development that we have uh, put in or the, the time that we put in with with the development team uh, with, with MTX, um, we have put in also a lot of time with a change enablement team uh, from that same vendor that focuses on uh, creating our training materials um, and, and organizing the the slide decks that we use for for trainings like we're doing like we're doing today. So just don't you know definitely don't get caught up so much on the on the development and the technology piece of it um, that you forget about that that kind of change enablement uh, piece in in the training of it. So I would say that's just a few things um, you know looking back and again. Uh, uh, you know, a lot can change in three weeks, um, but uh, I'm sure I'll have a few more lessons learned, but that's what I've got so far. Um, I know Stuart probably has some advice for us on some lessons learned before we uh, open it up to any q and A if if time allows for it. So Stuart, I'll let you close it out. Yeah, thank you. And I'll try to be quick here and I because I feel like I've now jinxed uh, Blake a little bit, but uh, <laughs> no, uh, so, you know, the lessons learned, uh, you know, to not to repeat anything that's already been said. I think what I would add on to that is uh, on the, you cannot underestimate the, the usability of the system. Uh, the, the vendors uh, will sell you everything. They will say, yes, absolutely. We've had all kinds of uh, usability, but the, what I would, uh, what I would do is I would have. The, the system that they have. So if they've got like a, kind of an off the shelf system, and I think that's the only way you can do it on such a short timeline is something has to exist. And for us that that we couldn't build something from scratch that was just off the table. And so what I would do is I would on that system have a use full usability technical evaluation of that and then prioritize getting those things fixed first. Um, that was one of the biggest pieces that I wish we would have done differently is having the system installed from the jump, like just straight away. The developers had to begin the development on their own environment in a, in a dev workspace that they hosted because we didn't have the technical uh, you know, hardware installed and set up and configured for them. And there was a, quite the dynamic in actually getting that done. So I would say that that, was, that would be one of the major things is bringing on the skills and resources that your tech uh, your your vendor does not have immediately 
um, and being able to bring those on. We went through the entire development process and then brought in the usability experts, and that was that was a big problem. Bernadette, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so the first one, um, and I'll start with Stuart for what you did, and then we'll go to Blake and Karen for what you're planning. Um, but how long did your old voter registration system have to run in parallel with the new voter registration system? Um, because states, you know, you can't, they don't feel like they can cut off the old system. Uh, so they're planning to, to run in parallel. Uh, I think Amy said you were going to start with me. So we did, we had our, we had a, a, a quiet period, I guess you could call it of a month where the both systems were live. So they were essentially, we took a snap, we stopped transactions in one and had the data moved over to the new system and then the, allowed the users to complete their data review and then begin working in the other system. Uh, around this same time, uh, our servers of the old system were reaching end of life, end of support, end of existence. And so uh, there was no way we could keep them and, and maintain the, the security of that system. So we were we were pushing really hard to, to not have that, but there, there will be stakeholders that want that. And if you're amenable to that idea, certainly you know, you, there's ways to do that, but we held fast that those systems are not safe and we have to unplug them as soon as possible. Blake, what are you guys planning? Yeah, so our plan is to uh, have our current voter registration system up as a uh, as a backup or fail safe or whatever you want to call it um, for a one to two months uh, at, at least. But they're not necessarily going to be running in parallel um, because you know we're, we're migrating the the data from our current voter registration system to our new voter registration system. And then um, we are telling, uh, we're, we're telling our county election officials, you know, you are working in this, in this new voter registration system. And if you have a need to do anything in the uh, old, at that point, uh, voter registration system, you need to notify us um, so, that, so that we're aware of what you're doing. Because data is gonna be able to migrate from uh, we're going to migrate data from our current system to our new system, um, but they're not going to be running in parallel so that we are, you know, updating our our old system with what's what's occurring in the new. So, but we're planning to keep it essentially propped up for uh, one to two months. And it, you know, we found it does give county election folks a, a little bit of a, uh, it makes them feel a little bit better when they're thinking about change, knowing that there's a safety net there just in case. Karen, are you planning for anything like that? Um, we're planning for, for very similar to what Blake and Stuart both just touched on, which is to leave the existing system up for a month um, with no transactions, but allowing for the clerks to do some data review um, so that they can feel comfortable, as Blake pointed out, and confident that everything's moved over in that large migration um, and that you know they, they feel confident that they haven't lost anything. Um, but they wouldn't be allowed to do any actual updates there. Thank you. Um, I got a question um, that I'm gonna go directly to Blake for. Um, how, have you had any issues with your DMV um, in getting your system to um, integrate effectively? Um, I know Georgia has a really robust electronic uh, record transfer relationship with DMV. So how is that playing out? Oh no. <laughs> that's that's how well it went, Amy. He just hung up on you. <laughs> um, so I'll answer until Blake comes back. But uh, for us um, in the state of Washington, we we built out an API uh, for because we we worked with DOL uh, to implement same day registration, and so we had to get real time transactions from them. So we built out an API, but with the idea that in the eventually. Other state agencies may come to pass to be actually able to support this type of technology, which turned out to be true. And, and so now we're able to integrate with any state agency that has all of the minimum required pieces of registration information. 
to hit that same API. And then we're starting to now consider if external organizations like Rock the Vote or et cetera would be able to uh, interface with that same API. And it's kind of a clever API because if you have all of the required pieces, it'll actually you know allow a submitted transaction. But if not, it just pre-populates the form and then the, the customer just has to complete what they're missing. So, for example, some state agencies don't have a signature. Well, they could go in and, and hit our API pre-populated form. User doesn't have to re-enter anything. They just have to complete the missing information. Blake, you're back. Did you hear the question? <laughs> I, I didn't hear all the questions. I think I know what it is from the comments, though, because they kept appearing on my screen. <laughs> was it about, was it, about uh, it was about the DMV? Yeah, and how you're working with your your DMV, and if you've had any integration issues. Yeah, so um, I'm going to say this is going to come as a surprise to people, but I've heard this from other feedback that we get because um, we've worked with them on on Eric related projects and that kind of thing. So our DDS Department of Driver Services is surprisingly good um, from what I hear in talking with other states, but I, I'm really happy with them. I got a good relationship with them, and. Um, we, we let them know as soon as we started the project um, before we needed them uh, so that they could assign essentially a product man or a project manager from their side. And, um, you know, we communicated to them early, set the expectations for them of, of what data we would be needing from them to test to make sure that, you know, the verifications and the transactions that we do with them uh, were going to work. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, no, we haven't, we haven't had any issues with that. We have time for one more question, if anybody has one. Okay, Megan. Oh, Megan, go ahead. If there aren't any others, just uh, wondering if, if you all are also working on sort of your public facing tools at the same time. We went through a rebuild of our system um, in 2016, early 2016, and uh, I was charged with the public facing site. And I remember what a harrowing experience that was to make sure all the data mapping worked with your public facing site. So I don't know if any of you have insight about how big of a lift that was to also make sure your new systems integrate with your public facing information. Yeah, so I can I can say from our perspective, um, we have what we call my voter page that a voter can log into, see their polling place, see their their district information, and that is going to be updating at the at the same time. The layout's going to be different. It's going to have some more capabilities uh, that uh, voters don't normally have under the current my voter page. For example, they can they'll be able to go in in the new new page and uh, update name, address if they want to, and so we we are building in that functionality. Uh, our online voter registration portal is going to be changing because it was connected to our um, similar to MVP. It was connected to our old uh, voter registration system. And so we're, we're updating those uh, as well. And then we have a, a absentee ballot portal that's going to be coming to um, with our with our new system. And so we've got we've got those things that that are uh, going to be changing. Okay. Aaron looks unhappy, but we did. We also did our, our voter portal uh, as well. Uh, we, we also did candidate filing portal, online voters guide, online markable ballot. It was a whole suite of things. Uh, but as you can imagine with a, a time crunch, we didn't really get to dedicate the, the type of analysis that we wanted to. And so now, now that we've got something in place, stable, reliable, we're working with a, a, a usability company to come in and do a, a full evaluation user study with our users, go embed themselves and uh, identify ways to improve that that system as well. And I can say quickly, our public facing sites are um, are on a separate network from our voter registration system. So um, we have a different team of people that are um, updating those as as the elections division requests based on usability and we do um, accessibility testing on all of our sites um, and penetration testing, cybersecurity testing. So we have a lot of stuff going on on those on a regular basis. So we weren't necessarily waiting for a change on the voter registration system 
to, you know, continue to maintain those other ones. So um, we're probably doing those on an ongoing basis. So it's, it hasn't necessarily need to tie in schedule wise. Well, thank you everyone. I uh, really appreciate you all sharing that information. That was really um, excellent. Um, and like I said, I can, you know, I, I remember that experience from our own state and it is a huge undertaking. So I give you all a ton of credit for all the, the work that you've done. So thank you so much. Um, up next, we have a panel that starts at 4 o'clock uh, Eastern time. So we've got about 12 minutes here. You should have the invite for the next panel which is uh, continuing processes from 2020 uh, that again starts at 4 o'clock Eastern. So we'll see you there. <laughs>